effects of course we we do uh, traditional prime broking so you ask uh, come to us and say yeah, i want uh, tier one liquidity then we'll i don't know if i can mention names but you know we we can give you access to a number of tier one uh, names where we have uh, access to uh, we have a, a prime broker for, for clearing so we can do give ups uh, as it's called but in the crypto world there's no concept of, of uh, prime broking and, and give up yet and and we are essentially the prime broker across uh, the market makers that, that we currently support two-thirds of his team he's basically done you know three ventures with um, and, and that is very very uh, impressive um, because then you know that they've gone through probably both paradise and hell. And, and you kind of need that, you know, because especially in crypto, as you know, it's very volatile. Like you, you have one day where you believe that you are, you know, you know, untouchable and superpower in the world. And the next day you realize that you're almost not worth anything. Um, and, and, and you need to be able to go through that volatility. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Lars Holtz, the founder of GCEX, or as he calls it, uh, GSEX, um, an online brokerage um, playing in the wholesale investment banking um, aspect of the industry. Uh, and uh, Dusan uh, Stoyanovic, uh, who is my very good friend and uh, managing partner of uh, a venture capital company that is invested in GSEX. Um, and I wanted to um, secure from Lars a sense of an idea of where the online brokerage, uh, especially the wholesale side of it, the, the corporate side of it, the, the prime brokerage aspect of it, the investment banking aspect of it, uh, where is that heading? Is there anything revolutionary taking place in that front? Uh, and, uh, and how he, uh, as an entrepreneur, sees uh, a lot of the new technologies that are coming on, on stream uh, that uh, threatens to um, disintermediate uh, the brokerage function uh, on in the online brokerage industry. So let's get right into the conversation. Last host, uh, you're joining us from London and Dusan uh, Stoyanovic, my very good friend, uh, joining us from Singapore. I'm here in Beijing. And I've got a very interesting conversation to have with both of you. I looked at Last Holtz, uh, founder of GCEX. You're going to explain to us what that does. Uh, and online brokerage, uh, you know, and, and all of that. And also your uh, pedigree uh, as an uh, online brokerage investment banker with, um, you know, in the good old days with Saxor Bank, which was an innovative company in its own right, uh, and now uh, founder of a, uh, a new edge um, transformational platform um, that is going to be transforming the space uh, around the brokerage investment banking uh, industry. So let's get right into the conversation. Lars Holtz, uh, GCEX uh, brokerage uh, founder. Uh, tell us a little bit about GCEX. Yeah, thanks, Manuel. Thanks for organizing. I guess my background is more traditional finance and I guess GCEX is rooted in uh, a lot of traditional finance. Uh, so we, we started out uh, and kind of said from day one, we wanted to be regulated and want to be regulated wherever we go. Uh, so uh, also in my previous companies, uh, that's kind of been a foundation uh, of, of what, what we've, we, uh, we've done. So first up, we got the FCA license, you know, both for, for traditional finance, kind of standard investment firm. And then we also on the, uh, on the crypto asset register. And we are in the process of expanding that regulatory coverage uh, to, uh, to the EU. Uh, and and Dubai and you know hopefully with, with the help of of uh, GTV and and Dusan and, and their network also into Singapore because there's no doubt about that, that of course Singapore is uh, really at the forefront of this whole uh, digital uh, transformation that we're seeing and I guess that was also uh, one of uh, hopefully many uh, points that that attracted both uh, me to GTV and and uh, GTV to to us in a nutshell Emmanuel it's it's uh, I will always say it's not really rocket science, uh, you know, what we do. Uh, we, of course, have some technology whereby you can uh, aggregate pricing across uh, uh, multiple venues. Um, and then you have some, some risk management and auto management, and then you uh, spit out the price on the other side to, to the buy side. Uh, and, and then you, you can trade. It's essentially, you know, exchange technology. Um, and... 
uh, again, we, we cover some traditional products, uh, you know, foreign exchange uh, commodities and, and uh, exchange tokens, uh, you know, Bitcoin, Ethereum, et cetera. Anything essentially that moves. I, I think we have a lot of good ideas that, that we need to get cracking on uh, together with, with the GDV for, for 2022 and, and going forward. Why did you call your company GCEX? We actually started out as a global crypto exchange. Um, and uh, we were incorporated and, and founded as Global Crypto Exchange, but uh, we actually struggled to get a bank account. Um, and then um, I, I won't mention any na bank names because uh, that, that would maybe be too, too, too aggressive, but uh, Global Crypto Exchange, we couldn't actually get a fiat account in, in the UK with a high street bank. Uh, and then uh, we changed the name to GC Exchange and uh, then we got a bank account. We uh, tr uh, also registered GSEX as a by name of, of uh, GC Exchange. Because GC Exchange so, is a bit long to, to say every time we pick out the phone, so we just say GSEX. So this, this whole idea of being a product agnostic platform sort of grew over time. You started as a, a crypto exchange and then uh, you wanted to see what, or you found that you could do, you could put any asset on it. You could put equities on it. You could put FX on it. Um, and, and then it, the idea just grew. Yes, you might say so. I, I guess in, in the digital world, we started almost three years ago. FX, you know, is, is the world's biggest market and, and they say it's going to be bigger than, than FX uh, in, in the years to come. Um, but we already said that two years ago. So I was actually very excited about STOs and I still am. Uh, and that's inside regulatory parameter. But maybe um, NFTs is, is going to overtake it. You know, who knows? I, I guess when you start out, you, you don't know. You have to be pretty... Uh, how, how do I say flexible and, and uh, you know, uh, kind of go go with the flow. And uh, I guess we, we also need to see what, what's next. Uh, right now, uh, uh, the, the majority of the flow we, we get is, is uh, kind of standard tokens, Bitcoin, Ethereum, uh, and, and you know, uh, any ERC20 token, and, and then uh, a little bit of, of Ripple as well. So your core trading uh, asset is uh, uh, basically cryptocurrencies, and then and then you're building the FX and the other asset classes. No, the, t the technology and, and us, we, we started out really with the foreign exchange uh, as, as a product. I started out in, in 99 with, with FX, and we made all the mistakes that, that you see a lot of uh, crypto guys, they do. Uh, so we have scaled technology to, to much higher throughput in, in crypto. The, the number of price updates per second is much higher in FX than in crypto. So to add something that's less uh, traded, you know, uh, much lower throughput and, and uh, requires much less bandwidth, of course, is easier than, than the other way around. So we started with FX uh, and that's kind of our background. And then we added uh, products to that. How different is uh, GSEX? Uh, how different is that from Sexo, where you were in the pioneering group of uh, salespeople uh, when it got its license in the early 2000s? Um, how different is that? And how different are you from any number of platforms that are now offering this um, you know, high latency uh, or rather low latency um, tr uh, transaction platforms um, around the world. I think building technology, you know, um, you you, it, you can't really, of course, it just needs to be stable. But there's a lot of, of good technology out there. Uh, TGV they actually invested in in the FX technology platform in in Singapore as well. That that probably can handle more throughput than than, than we can. Uh, but they specialize in in one area. Uh, so it's the combination of of the regulation and the technology uh, that, that I think differentiates us. Uh, you know, what's different to, to Saxo Bank? Uh, again, um, I, I left you know, 17 years ago, but uh, we are quite a few people here that, that have been with Saxo Bank in the past. Uh, according to their December update numbers, uh, they focus a lot on, on equities these days, uh, as do a lot of other people in, in the space, Robin Hood, uh, et cetera. Uh, and we specifically do not uh, do equities. I think uh, instead of spending time on equities, I'd much rather go straight to security tokens. I, I really firmly believe that, uh, that that security tokens will will overtake the kind of traditional trading market for for equities and, and derivatives. Uh, but hey, uh, yet to be seen. Okay, let's ask Dusan. Uh, Dusan, what? Uh... 
did you see that was attractive about last uh, GSEX uh, and, and how did, does that fit into your overall portfolio? Uh, and where do you think he's taking the technology? Yeah, as you probably know, Emmanuel, we, we, we do look at, at, at you know, our bets, no matter stage, if the team for us is the most important part. Um, um, and even if the companies like, uh, like Lars company, which is actually profitable, it's still the team which is number one for us. Um, so, so for us, it was uh, basically, yeah, uh, definitely immediately impressed by, you know, the main entrepreneur, Lars, in his case for G6. But does he manage to attract, you know, a very strong and solid team around him? And what we see here is, uh, yeah, I mean, definitely, you know, without going into a lot of level of details, but, you know, his, you know, like two thirds of his team is basically done, you know, three ventures with. Um, and, and that is very, very uh, impressive um, because then you know that they've gone through probably both paradise and hell. And, and you kind of need that, you know, because especially in crypto, as you know, it's very volatile. Like you, you have one day where you believe that you are, you know, you know, untouchable and superpower in the world. And the next day you realize that you're almost not worth anything. And, and, and you need to be able to go through that volatility and if you have gone through a couple of companies since ups and downs, which are always included in ups and downs in those formation companies, and especially with you know a team, uh, th that's great. So, so I think that, that that's basically that we saw that he has managed to surround himself with a fantastic uh, team, and, and quite honestly, also that he has one key woman there as well, uh, Olga, that you know has been around uh, and worked together with him which you know, for us is important that there is some kind of strong female representation at some stage in the organization. Um, so, so I think we, we saw that. So yeah, the team, the team and uh, Lars himself, the team around him. And I would also add also even on the board level, right? That we could see that you know, the board is not just sitting there you know, to kind of roll and uh, make some minutes and make some comments on the board minutes, but they really wanted to, to be engaged. And, and they are, and, and I think it's pretty impressive that he's set up to use such a, so the team aspect is all over the place there, Emmanuel. And, and for us, that was basically, uh, you know, take it, ticked off the boxes immediately. Um, now, the second piece that I would like to say is, I think he's at the right spot. You know, he's at the right spot when, when this asset class is starting to become heavily, you know, uh, heavily institutionalized. And obviously having a regulated background and, and, and an institutional background like he and his team has, um, that's perfect. Why not, you know, to kick off a business like that in the UK with, with you know, relations in the UK, not, not bad at all, right? It, it is still, you know, one of the largest financial centers in the world, and I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. What's good about, you know, really international people uh, living in the UK, they, they look at Europe as one part that they want to expand into, but also the rest of the world. It's that, that kind of global mindset, uh, which is important. So I would say, you know, team, the right spot, and basically the international expansion plan. That's the three things that really got us really, really excited. I'm excited to have this conversation because I want to know uh, last thinking about where this entire intermediation uh, industry is evolving to. Uh, I mean, you're at the frontier, you see, I mean, you're talking about NFT and so on, but uh, uh, I'm thinking about Tezos and, um, you know, PancakeSwap becoming brokerages in themselves. I mean, you know, little tokens being doing the, the intermediation function and where will that leave um, uh, the, the platforms that, you know, companies like yours is building. So I want to get there at some point, uh, but let me ask you first. Uh, what is the critical? What are the critical success factors of a online brokerage business that the one that you're running? I wanted to have a technology conversation, but from what um, Dusan just mentioned, uh, he was uh, impressed with the people element. Uh, and now let's hear from you, uh, Lars. Uh, what you think are the critical success factors of your platform business? Well, I just if if you want to get into to technical details, I have to warn you, I'm, I'm not a technician technician by 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 background, so so I I, I know high level about kind of uh, technology. So, but but just to forewarn you there. Well, I guess Robin Hood is actually a good example of. Um, of course, we would all love to be like Robin Hood. I think uh, Dusan and, and uh, all the other investors they would be uh, you know over the moon if we got to that 
level. Uh, but again, that's an, another company that, that um, you know, of course, is focusing on, on equities and they're focusing on retail. Uh, I think we, we didn't touch upon that. We, we do not uh, take any retail fines. Uh, and uh, if, if we look kind of, that's at least my philosophy, uh, I sold a company a couple of years ago uh, as well, where we also focused on on professional clients. Uh, so, so it's more the informed investor uh, that that can take their own decisions, uh, and there's also less regulatory risk by dealing with with uh, professional clients. Uh, so, so, that that's at least one uh, USP. And then you also said your pancake swaps and, and people they could uh, you know might maybe skip the the brokerage level. Uh, yes, that's also possible if if you really uh, take time and and you know you you are evangelist or a blockchain evangelist, but it's actually pretty difficult to get started. And and that's probably the number one USP for us that that we can tell people you know, hey. Uh, you don't need to go out and, and create your own wallet. Uh, so, so we only work with, with regulated custodians uh, that where you don't need to worry about, you know, the theft of, of coins. Uh, they're insured, they're regulated, it's, it's safe. Uh, and, and you actually get everyone, everything from, from uh, a one-stop shop. And that's us, you know, turnkey solution. We call it crypto in the box. Uh, so, so you don't need to uh, go you know, all over the place, uh, you can find uh, tier one liquidity, uh, just like Robinhood. Uh, and and we, we can take care of, of both the fiat custody and the crypto custody. Uh, and and you, you need to only have one trusted and, and uh, uh, regulated counterparty, and that's the uh, GSEX. So are you offering your platform as a white label platform to, um, you know, to traditional banks, anyone, who wants to have access to a, a platform uh, and is liquidity added in there somewhere. Uh, and, you know, your success providing liquidity, one of the critical success factors. Yes, we, we definitely do wide label uh, big time. So uh, again, turnkey solutions, you know, we used to call it broker in a box. That was kind of a traditional uh, white label phrase. And then came up with this crypto in a box. Uh, I actually wanted to register the domain crypto in a box, but uh, then some sort of domain broker called me and you know quoted me thirty five thousand dollars for crypto in a box dot com. Uh, I kindly declined. Um, but uh, white labeling is extremely modular, very open. Uh, comes with liquidity, but you can also source your own liquidity. So we we provide a list of of uh, uh, exchanges where we have connectivity to and and market makers, and they can do bilateral settlement, or they can use us as the prime broker for the settlement in in the middle. Uh, so it's a very open, very flexible. Uh, we have banks uh, doing white labeling uh, and 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 brokers, so traditional brokers and you know more uh, crypto focused brokers. So I'll, I'll be honest with you, we have not been super successful. Uh, in in position ourselves as as uh, you know crypto exchange as such, it's really been uh, traditional banks and brokers coming to us for a trusted counterparty for for their crypto business. What's happening to the prime broker uh, world as a result of players like you? That's one reason we also were looking to to expand our capital base uh, was to to really uh, execute on the prime broker vision for for crypto. Uh, there is no concept of a prime broker in, in crypto today because it's, it's not a standardized product. You can't sign it on, on the standardized uh, legal uh, framework. Uh, and until that point in time, then, you know, there, there's, there's no interbank concept of, of uh, prime broking. Even though I have read some, some articles about that uh, the IST organization, they are about to uh, add uh, Bitcoin and Ether to uh, to the ISTA uh, standard. But, but you started as foreign FX. So I'm sure that uh, there was that, uh, there was prime brokerage involved there. Yes, yes. So so FX, of course, we, we do uh, traditional prime broking. So you ask, uh, come to us and say, I want uh, to one liquidity. Then we'll, I don't know if I can mention names, but you know, we, we can give you access to a number of tier one uh, names where we have uh, access to. Uh, we have a, a prime broker for, for clearing. So we can do give ups uh, as it's called. But in the crypto world, there's no concept of, of uh, prime broking and, and give up yet. 
and, and we are essentially the prime broker across uh, the market makers that, that we currently support. We also need to worry about counterparty risk, uh, but, but you know, we, we add uh, exchanges and, and market makers uh, kind of, not daily, but you know, uh, on an ongoing basis. But are you in a crowded space? Um, you know, there are several players, um, you know, all of whom are building technology platform. And, and actually at the end of the day, it's, it's the technology that, that uh, determines whether you, uh, whether you grow. I wouldn't say that uh, because it standardized technology, uh, again, taking your price in uh, and, and doing some risk management or management in the middle and, and spitting out the price again, that I would say that's pretty trivial. It's more that, that you can hook it up to, to wallets uh, that, that you can uh, claim that, that you are uh, regulated, that you can provide the liquidity. Uh, so, so there's a lot of tech players that they, they can only give you the, the tech. Uh, and, and then you need to go out and find a prime broker. Then you need to go out and find a wallet or you need to go out and find a fiat setups. So that's again where we, we make it easy for you. You can get uh, everything from, from us from a one-stop shop, tier one, uh, you know, interbank FX liquidity and, and you know, uh, tier one uh, crypto liquidity. Do you think that greater liquidity uh, and depth in terms of, you know, types of liquidity and so on uh, will eventually stabilize um, cryptocurrency, um, you know, given how volatile it is? Um, you know, what, what, how do you think that will evolve over time? Uh, or how do you think that's evolving right now in terms of who's in crypto, um, you know, and how the market is maturing? On one hand, we like volatility because uh, that, that usually means uh, there's more trading, but, but too much volatility also scares away people. If it's too volatile, then, you know, some institutional players, they probably deem it to be not uh, super serious. <laughs> so it, it would be good that we could kind of calm down the volatility uh, slightly. Uh, but, you know, even the introduction of, of uh, Bitcoin on, on CME has not been able to kind of uh, put, put, put a, a cap on, on volatility. Uh, but it also put it into perspective, you know, volatility on, on Bitcoin is, is kind of uh, equivalent to, to Turkish lira. Uh, nothing against Turkish lira, obviously, <laughs> but just to put it into perspective. Uh, it, it would be nice if it could calm down. And I, I guess we need a few more <clears throat> tier one names to, to come in as, as makers, market makers. So they can kind of uh, take uh, to the top of, of uh, these wild swings uh, out of the market. So these market makers that you're talking to, aren't they developing their own platforms? Aren't they uh, building their own networks? Uh, you know, they, they, their first job is to go around looking for clients. So, uh, you know, they, they're already quite aggressive in their own right. So why would they work with you? Tier one names, just mentioned uh, Goldman Sachs, you know, that there's a reason <laughs> that you, you don't go to, to them directly uh, because they, they only want, you know, people that aggregate and have a certain volume. Uh, and, and we are, of course, that, that middleman. That, that's what I've been doing for, for the past uh, 20 years. Uh, you know, uh, Saxo Bank, they also go to tier one names, even though it's, it's a bank and it's, you know, deemed to be one of the biggest players in the space. They also hedge with, with the interbank uh, players because the clients of, of Saxo, now you mentioned Saxo, not, not to go on, uh, they cannot go to, you know, uh, the prime broker of, of Saxo uh, directly. So they need to have a middleman like Saxo. We uh, have the same job in, in crypto. The, the market makers, uh, they don't want to talk to uh, hundreds or thousands of, of, of clients. Uh, most of the tier one names, you need to be regulated. You need to be regulated from a tier one jurisdiction. Whereas, you know, I, I can take a client on from, uh, you know, Malaysia or, 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 or Singapore or elsewhere, whereas they, they will not do so. So we, we facilitate that, that uh, in, in, in between, so to say. How much your client base looking like right now? Um, you know, who do you have as clients? Uh, and is this whole transition that banks are now becoming, you know, crypto uh, you know, they're, they're, they're wrapping their minds around crypto. They, they want to provide some form of crypto service to their high net worth clients. Is that creating opportunities for you? We would, of course, welcome. It would be great for us, for, for the market, that, that uh, just one, say one name, would uh, say, yeah, we, we are now supporting this. We are, we are uh, kind of giving this out to our clientele. But uh, unfortunately, at this point in time, uh, it's still, you know, at, at arm's length. 
uh, they're debating and you know, as, as you said you know, they're probably considering or they have some committee somewhere in in the bank considering it so it's probably not going to be a 2022 project either um unfortunately but it would be good for all of us uh, and also gsec we work actually with a couple of, of tier one names but i i, I don't think uh, I, I'm, I'm allowed to to say who who they are uh, where i know uh, they can actually provide pricing but they only do it on a test basis to someone like us so, so they have a proof of concept Dusan, when you were doing your due diligence on GSEX, uh, who else were you looking at uh, to give you a sense of, um, you know, benchmarking uh, where they were in their journey? And where, do you th- where would you as an investor say they are in their journey? And what are the milestones that you're setting up for them? We were looking at it uh, uh, really to see if there was something like this um, in Southeast Asia, because obviously that's, you know, where the VC is regulated and we were trying to see, is there something like that here? Um, and uh, is, are they, and basically is the team strong enough and, and did a little bit of comparison. I, as, uh, as probably Lars mentioned in, in his initial introduction, uh, we have one of our partners who is actually running uh, a considerable FX business um, in Singapore, which has actually become global now, which is not competing with what Lars is doing at all. Um, so we were trying to see, you know, is there something here that can actually really play that kind of um, institutional play? And yes, I mean, you know, th- th- there are other actors, but but I, I think what we're trying to, like what what highly institutionalized, like 100% institutions, no, no retail, like does it take off that? Number two, does it actually take off a platform? Like Lars hasn't mentioned it, but he also has, you know, the former CTO from Saxo Bank uh, as his CTO. And, um, you know, the, the platform is actually very good um, in, in trust of technology. So, so like, number one, is it 100% institutionalized? Is the actually platform really strong, uh, both, you know, from an onboarding perspective, but highly autom- automated, highly scalable, actually? Um, yes, so that, that was kind of the second point. Um, and then the, the third point is, uh, from, from a regulation point of view, does, you know, does the company come from a, from a highly regulated environment? Uh, yes, right? So, so that, that's the kind of uh, three areas, like highly institutionalized platform regulation. Um, do we have something like that that we want to take a, a bet on? And I would say you know, the market in general is, is very fragmented. Um, and, and then for us, what was really, really the most important part, which we only found out, obviously, when we digged in very deep into GCX, like who, who are the main, you know, stakeholder partners that Lars has. And, and, and you know, yeah, I mean, he's been so long uh, in the industry that, that and, and GCX with that, that actually they do have access to, to fantastic partners within the financial services industry. So, so that I, I would say is number four. So what was our suspicion like or our positive, you know, think about the team kind of proved right when we started to dig deep into it. Um, and the deeper we, we, we basically dig into it, the more interesting it became. Um, so I think that's, that last differentiator we didn't see on the surface that we only saw once we started to dig into the company. And, and, and that's where we can come in or Lars company can come in and bridge that gap. And, and they can try and pilot things immediately. With a, with a high, highly sky, scalable platform. So I'd be very, very excited about it, uh, not just for, for, for Europe, but like I said, especially for the Middle East and Southeast Asia. So, so yeah, when we were doing our benchmarking, we were also looking at the Middle East. I forgot to mention that. So we were also trying to see what can we do in the Middle East as well, because we are actually pretty strong in Middle East. So we believe that market is, is very, very important. And I, I think that's really the kind of from, from our point of view, there are kind of three, four centers in the world. Like, like, okay, let's US, I'm taking a part, but like Singapore, Dubai, Switzerland, UK. I mean, you gotta be, you know, in those markets if you, if you are uh, talking crypto. Okay, but uh, milestones that you've given them? You don't need to give milestones to serial entrepreneurs. They set up themselves. Okay. Put it this way, they're, they're, they're that aggressive. So I, it was more the other way around. Can we really do all this? Uh, as opposed to, uh, can we do more? What milestones have you given yourself, Lars? So I want to get the, the EU license. So uh, that's kind of my to-do list this month. Uh, then uh, via uh, Dusan, uh, before uh, him, we, we talked about uh, Dubai. Actually, we 
we actually closed the deal while I was in Dubai in, in November, quite funny. Uh, so I think that's also an area. Uh, and then uh, we need to agree on, on when we need to uh, uh, initiate some, some things in, in, in Singapore. So that's kind of uh, the 2022 milestones. Then uh, we, we need to streamline a lot of things. Uh, so even though, yeah, I, I think we're, we're good at, at certain things, we, we can uh, improve, of course, on, on all posts here in, in the company, no doubt about that. Uh, rolling out a new front end, uh, trading front end. Uh, there's al always some something you can do, Emmanuel. You know, when people say yeah. that they're, they're done, then, then they're lying because uh, I always wonder, you know, we actually have something that works today and, and still we, we want to uh, hire five more developers in Q1 and, you know, that's just the, na the, the nature of, of the beast. Uh, you, you're never done. What are some of the risks in this business, um, you know, now that you're getting your licenses? What are some of the risks in your business, in, in the current business model? Regulatory risk is always there. Uh, regulation uh, changes. Uh, we have seen that in, in FX in, in the years I've been uh, active. Uh, uh, you know, you also mentioned Robin Hood earlier today. They've also been fined. Of course, um, I'm, I feel sorry for them, but you know, they can afford it. But there, there's there's always these regulatory risks. You know that that you maybe you you do you don't do anything bad or wrong on purpose. Uh, but regulatory risk is is there. Uh, Trading risks, even though we don't take, we're not market makers. It's it's uh, we we pass through uh, everything to to again tier one providers. There's some some black swan event. Uh, I don't know if you remember the the Swiss National Bank in in 2015. Yeah. Uh, that of course uh, was it was the worst day of my life actually. Uh, the, the the 15th of January. I remember clearly. It was uh, 9:30 in the morning. So everyone that's been in FX, they don't remember that uh, where they were uh, at that point in time. Uh, so that that's of course also something uh, that that's a, a risk to to uh, the business. Uh, but the, I really think that the, the opportunities uh, outweigh any risks, and and we only uh, at at the beginning of this, uh, you know, coming back to security tokens, we haven't even started on that journey. Uh, NFTs, we haven't even started on that journey. Not that TCX, you know, with, with help of, of TTV, of course, that's also something we, we're going to look at in, in, in 2022. So, uh, yeah, the, the risks, a hey, regulatory risk, uh, liquidity risks. Um, but but I, I, I really uh, think that that's, uh, the biggest risk is that we we execute poorly. Uh, so, so God forbid that, that we just need to, to keep uh, uh, on our toes. I started this conversation uh, wanting to, you know, to, to get from you an idea of how intermediation itself is evolving, uh, especially on the whole side, wholesale side of uh, you know, brokerage, of, um, of trading and so on. Uh, the sense I get is you are involved in the automation of the brokerage industry. That automation um, aspect is still underway. Uh, and uh, digitization, which is putting a lot of the brokerage business uh, on a platform. Um, and in the category of service providers that you operate in, uh, there is a lot of, uh, um, you know, there are lots of players and there's a lot of uh, jostling, uh, jostling taking place uh, at the moment. Um, and uh, you come out as one of the leaders because of your uh, pedigree, um, you know, your experience. Uh, and also the ability to secure licenses uh, in uh, in the key markets, um, you know, and then on top of that comes the technology and the liquidity uh, pool sets that you've access to. Um, so it seems to be uh, the re the evolution rather than the revolution of the brokerage industry. Uh, would I be correct to uh, describe it as that, or is there something that I'm missing? No, I think actually um, that's actually not a, a bad summary. Uh, I think combined with 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 the custody side, that's of course the 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 the, the novel thing in in digital that that the clients can actually hold the assets on on, on in their browser on their phone, uh, and and we again uh, have a secure environment. Uh, so I think I think you missed out on on a USP kind of counterparty risk. Uh, so of course now we we have uh, you know additional balance sheet. We 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 have 
uh, a partner uh, like TGV and then uh, for, you know, we have more uh, partners lined up. Uh, so, so people should not be worried about you know, balance sheet or counterparty risk. They can safely trade with us in, in a secure regulated environment. Uh, because yes, you say it, it, is, it is crowded. There's also a lot of crap technology out there. Uh, a lot of people, they claim they do ABC maybe they do abc you know half baked uh, maybe they are regulated in in some obscure uh, offshore jurisdiction where you don't know what actually what what powers uh, do the regulators have uh, if, if something should go wrong uh, and maybe you you transfer your your coins or your fiat to uh, some some uh, wallet that where you don't have any assurance about what's going to happen after that so there are a number of, of factors uh, to to consider when when you choose a, a partner uh, today, you know, intermediation is, is is it's many aspects to to consider. In fact, counterparty risk is something that I uh, wasn't very sure if I wanted to uh, go into, but that means that you need to be well capitalized, uh, and uh, then you get into traditional banking business, which is you know you you've got a balance sheet. Uh, is there a temptation to have a balance sheet at some point? Uh, and and by the way, how well can how well are you capitalized right now? Again, that that's in in the public domain. Of course, we, we just uh, got uh, four million from from TGV. So so taking out tier one capital to to eight, uh, eight between eight and nine million, uh, and you know we're profitable. But but more importantly, as I said, we don't do self custody of the coins. So so you don't have uh, the risk of of you know anything happening to to your wallet or or your assets. Uh, they are. Uh, separate they're segregated uh, so, so we, we try to kind of take away the, these concerns the institutional concerns uh, uh, you know preventing a more adoption of, of uh, digital trading is the regulation you know counterparty risk and, and safety of funds you know all research say the same you know uh, regulation counterparty risk and safety of funds and we try to address them uh, you know one by one and that's why uh, we i believe that that we will also be uh, uh, the, the intermediation uh, partner of choice going forward have you started to even look into that whole area of uh, token based trading uh, you know uh, lending against uh, assets uh, that that uh, seem to be defining defi right now uh, lots of activity on that front, and uh, it's frontier territory. Uh, there are no one major player yet. Uh, isn't isn't it tempting to get into that area? We do. Um, that's another benefit we have. We we can also uh, give give you know uh, some some staking benefits. You you can get uh, yields on on deposits, but we we do it very uh, in a non exotic way. I would say uh, so. It's it's it's, it's not. Uh, they, they stay in your your wallet we, we do it in a safe regulated environment we only do it with regulated counterparties uh, actually one of one of our partners is also a potential portfolio company for for TTV so I think it's good to kind of have a, a trusted ecosystem uh, where we can uh, operate great I think uh, you've answered most of my questions I think I have a more realistic idea uh, of how the industry is evolving. As I said, it's more evolving rather than uh, revolutionizing at the moment. Uh, and you've added uh, the uh, the new the new asset class, uh, you know, cryptocurrencies and so on. And then I'm sure you're going to be doing NFTs and so on. So uh, so it's an evolution evolutionary phase. That's what I'm learning uh, from you uh, in terms of uh, the digitization of the brokerage industry. So, gentlemen, thank you very much for sharing with me your thoughts. Uh, these conversations helps me to. Uh, map out in my own mind uh, how the industry is evolving and how different components of the industry is evolving. Uh, in, in this case, investment banking, brokerage, uh, trading. Uh, thank you very much.